Um, so I'm Jonathan Carricker. Um, a lot of people know me by my um, avatar name, which was Prathen, uh, while I was at Sony Online slash Daybreak slash Darkpaw. Um, I started uh, working in the game industry officially in 2002 and um, started out as a tech support guy because it was something I had been doing at college and I, and I knew EverQuest really well and I saw they were hiring for tech guys. So I came down uh, shortly after I graduated from college um, and then applied from uh, in, internally to work on EverQuest. Um, and then for the next 18 years, I mostly worked on EQ in, in various capacities. I, I did um, some brief tours in other games. I worked on Free Realms and EQ2 and EQ Next, um, but most of that uh, time was spent on EverQuest. And as of very recently, uh, I am a Quest content designer on World of Warcraft. Um, and I'm just learning the ropes. So, so yeah, we're we're going to start at the beginning, and then. At some point, when we get when we get to where you're at now, I have some have some questions there as well, and I know mm -hmm. a lot of folks do. Um, uh, some of them, uh, uh, I'm going to already assume that uh, they're 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 going to be the usual question. After only 18 years, why did you leave and stuff like that? Um, but we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll hit those later, and unless it's just a recurring theme in in the in the chat, and um, then we can just get it out of the way but so going going all the way to sort of the, the beginning like how did you how did you end up at sony uh so if we go back to the beginning beginning um i had been playing uh, muds all all through college you know i found um i found that that muds were like it was like my my gaming game of choice it was this multiplayer experience it was it was high fantasy it was all text but it was still like it was incredible to like play with other people and group together and kill stuff and you know it was pvp and um, it was it was a really cool experience and when everquest came out i was like holy cow this is like a mud but it's 3d this is this is incredible and this is way ahead of its time and i i could i could see while playing a mud that at some point that was going to be a 3d game but i didn't think it was that that close i thought it was like you know, 10 or 15 years off as opposed to being like five years later. Right. Uh, so I got, I got into EQ, um, played a lot of that. Um, after I graduated from college, um, I continued working at the university I was at and while, while playing a whole lot of EQ. Um, and, and it was, it was fine, but I, I really wanted to get into gaming and I really, I really had a lot of love for EQ, um, and a lot of time in EQ. Uh, so as soon as I saw that they were, they were hiring people, I was like, dude, I got to get my foot in the door. And so, mm -hmm. Um, I applied, came down, um, interviewed with Vic Wachter and uh, Tony Rado, and they're like, yeah, dude, you should totally, you should totally work with us. Uh, so then I was, I was a tech support guy, uh, like the old, um, the phone, phone banks job where you pick up the phone and say, um, you know, thank you for calling Sony Online Entertainment. I'm Jonathan Carricker. Can I get your name and phone number, please? And, oh man, I uh, remember, I remember like the the little canned text because it was that way even as a GM, right? We had like our little yeah, high macro. Um, before you go further, and oh, what were you doing at the what were you doing at the college at the time? I was a computer science major. Mm -hmm. um, I I nearly I nearly changed my major to uh, to music, but uh, I, I stuck with it. <laughs> stuck with the original plan. I got my comp sci degree, um, and you know any 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 chance that I got, if if I could you know weasel it into a school project, I was working on game design stuff, and I was also doing that on the side. Uh, so I was I was making games in Flash and um, and then making games and doing level design as like class projects. Cool. Like my uh, my senior project was was a level design thing, which I'm surprised they let me get away with because it wasn't super computer sciencey. It's more it was more like CAD, but they were all right with it. <laughs> right. And I think it was it ended up being useful. In in the beginning, um, when you're looking at getting your foot in the door, um. Did you think that that level design, like that style of work was going to be what you're going to be doing or? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I had a, a completely upside down view of like what a game designer's life was like. I, I assumed that like, if you were working on EverQuest, like you were going to be an artist and you were going to be a programmer and you were going to be a designer. And I, I just assumed that like everyone did everything. I didn't realize that once you, once you run a team, especially a big team, that everybody has their role, you know, like right. this, this guy does animation and this guy builds models and this guy builds levels and 
so it was yeah i was uh it was a real surprise to get on the team and realize that like people people just had a niche and they they just did this this one thing um yeah and honestly that that kind of evolved right before you before you got on the team um the 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 degree to which there, there were niches or more specialized roles was actually relatively new so so um, yeah coming back you so you you got in you you had your um you had your sort of day job of answering the phones and and i assume that uh when you got there it was immediately if you're anything like i was like looking around going okay my foot is now in the door along with the rest of me what what's the next door that i put my foot through right like <laughs> was that the uh, case? i guess i guess what like getting my getting my toe in the door was like doing um beta testing so when pop came out or pop was still in development um i got into the, the beta and uh was beta testing and i remember raid testing i think Sarin with you um and, and some of the other events in plane of torment mm. it was it was plane of torment right yeah yeah remember that correctly okay yep <laughs> and uh it wasn't it wasn't very long after it was maybe six months after i was there that i saw they were hiring apprentices for everquest mm -hmm. um and you had to submit a, a zone design doc or a quest design um so I, I worked like i worked all night on that for like a month and um which is hard because I, I just wanted to play EverQuest, but instead of playing EQ, my guildmates were like, "Where are you We're raiding?" I'm like, "Oh, dude, I could work on this this quest design doc. It's gonna be great. <laughs> Got to get into the gaming industry." Yeah. Uh, so then um, I interviewed with the the team, which was intense because it was like every designer on EverQuest at the time in a room, like all sitting around, rapid firing questions, bang, 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 bang. <laughs> you know, I was heart was beating so fast, and trying not to not to panic too hard. Um, it's a, a bunch moment. a bunch of people on the team were imposing at that time which <laughs> i want to uh i want i want to get to at some point but yeah <laughs> okay that sounds interesting yeah it's it's a tough <laughs> one right because you're like i've i've just spent like a month hoping hoping for this opportunity don't want to mess it up and this this may be my one shot to like get on a team yeah i, yeah, I did feel like that i was like i'm not going to throw away my shot i want to get onto this team I want to work on a game. I want to get in the gaming industry. I love EverQuest. I got to do this. So, um, so I really, I really put together. I think a, a, a cool zone design idea, complete with like a full three D or not three D, full full two D color color map and, and a bunch of quest ideas and the story for the zone and the main antagonist. So, um, Frank just asked, what was the design doc on? Do you remember? Um. Yeah, I think I, I think I wrote a. a a zone design doc about uh, an area where there was um, um, a really powerful gnome, but he felt like nobody took him seriously. And so then he like um, killed off everybody in the town. And uh, what, what you showed up in afterwards was like this, this destroyed village where he, he was in charge, but he was an illusionist. So some things were real and some weren't. And you were trying to like, you know, puzzle, puzzle through what happened. And this is, this obviously is not something that went live. Um, this was just me you know, me jamming on an idea and, and trying to show that I could, I could do something game design for the team. That sounds like something we would have loved. Did we love it? Uh, I, I hope so. Um, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know if I got a whole lot of feedback apparently. on it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to see if I can find it. And I know a, a ton of people applied at that time. So you probably were overwhelmed. Um, ended up being four, four apprentices got brought on um, of the, however many people who applied. It was um, Carly Toll. Mm -hmm. And me and Norm Freeman mm -hmm. and um, Tom Blair, yeah, yeah, all all came out at the same time. Yep, yeah, I, yeah, which is it's, it's weird because I, I didn't remember like Carly and like all of you at the same time. I remember like more individually for some reason, but it makes sense that it was during that period. Yeah, like we were downstairs, so it was it was kind of weird, like. Um, it really had like a full house. Like people were packed in, multiple people to an office. Um, there were really small cubicles up there, and everybody was like, you know, kind of shoulder to shoulder. So when the apprentices came on, we were downstairs in the in the dark. <laughs> like if you if you came into the the building that would have been building two, you'd come in downstairs and turn left, and there was a room down there, and we were all kind of sitting around in the dark working together. Um, we weren't we weren't really like mingling with the with the design team for for a couple months really. Yeah. Until there was space for us upstairs. That I mean, honestly, that was the same experience I had. 
Um, yeah. It was the same room. It was the same. <laughs> I don't think it was as dark for some reason. Um, yeah, maybe we, maybe we should have turned the lights on. I, I don't know. We just kind of like went with the flow. So if the lights were off, we probably were like, oh, yeah. I guess this is how it's supposed to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So interview process. Um, you, you said that there was some intimidating personalities or what was it do you want to are you so, saving that or oh no no so like um it was it was really not what I was, what I was expecting when I when I got on the team and for like the first I don't know six months after we had um Rich Waters mm-hmm. who's like six foot five 300 pounds at least it was six foot um five. yeah he's a giant of a guy that was uh Robert Fister yeah who was probably six, six foot Four, six foot eight yeah he was 350 huge. pounds <laughs> <laughs> there was norm who was probably six foot three 250 pounds um chris ko ended up joining and that guy's a giant he's yeah. he's like uh he's like hagrid uh who who else bill, bill james was a, a giant guy there was just like a whole bunch of a whole bunch of people on the team who were like <laughs> un, unusually like large guys um, even even people like uh, like Krause, even though he wasn't like like huge, he was like six foot four. Um, Ian Noble was six foot four. Like I don't I don't know. Like, it's like like all the all the tall people in the gaming industry, all the big people ended up working on EQ for some reason. Yeah. And I'm uh, I'm I'm north of of six foot and over two hundred pounds, and I felt small in a lot of those situations around these like giant people. <laughs> <laughs> question yeah. just came in from scorn is this a basketball team or a development team <laughs> it was not as agile as a basketball team these were all very big big dudes you know there was a um there was a day where there was a really big earthquake that shook the shook the building just bang, 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 everything's shaking but uh several people thought it was robert fister chomping around because he would do that he would like you know, stomp, 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 stomp. And we're on the second floor and everything would shake and you'd be like, what the hell? When people really could, could not distinguish between an actual earthquake and the, and the producer tromping around in the hallway. And, um, and there was the, uh, the wrestling matches too. Like, yeah, I was about to say, would go at it. So I, uh, (laughs) like, like get each other in headlocks and like, and like Craig was an athletic guy and he was a big guy, but he, he was, you know, again, like tiny compared to Fister. And then they'd be out there going at it, pushing each other, knocking each other into cubicle, you know, barriers. Yeah. I, I was about to say, I remember one of the, the earthquakes is when uh, Fister tackled me into one of the walls of the cube farm. And you could see cubicles like ripple and move all the way across the entire <laughs> cube farm before I somehow oh, got him through the doorway of his office <laughs> and was able to take him down onto his couch, which promptly broke like we heard it break. <laughs> And so we had to quickly time out and just be like, was that ribs or just, just broken couch. Perfect. That's amazing. Oh, dude. It was, good to I, it was, it was a crazy time. I, I can't believe we, yeah. I can't believe we always all survived that time. Oh, I can't. And it was, it was weird. We were, we were just, we were all just kids, you know, like it was the wild west of the gaming industry. And we were trying to figure out what the hell we were doing and what, what an MMO was going to look like. Yeah. So then I think it's, it's interesting because um, as we work through like the transition of you onto the team at about the same time that we were transitioning in scripting. So speaking yeah, of true. what an MMO would look like, right? Like um, it was that period when you were coming onto the team and, and um, several others. And it was like the kind of the next generation of folks really. Um because we came in as the crew that kind of took over in Luckland, post Luckland. And then as you and other folks came in and we had scripting emerging, the content really started to change a bit as well, like during that period, especially the raids and stuff. Like, what do you remember from like the transition and in, in, in kind of those experimental days? Yeah, uh, that was, I think scripting was used in pop, but at that point it was still pretty rudimentary and the team was still kind of getting a handle on how to use it, you know, um, nothing had really been codified. You could, you could, you could tell by people like tinkering with scripts in, in pop, like, like people didn't, didn't have any sort of standard and they were kind of just trying to like 
uh, make things just just get it get it to work and there wasn't a lot of documentation there was almost no comments in these scripts of course um, not yeah of, co of course not um and and it was just kind of coming off that invisible shout system and, and there was some stuff in in pop that was clearly a hybrid where they were they were using the invisible shouts as well as invisible man as well as um the scripts and and, and cobbling stuff together uh, it, it took it took a lot of years for us to kind of find our footing and, and, and standardize stuff and decide like, okay, we're, this is, this is how a raid is going to start. This is how it's going to end. This is how it's going to clean up. And we're going to, we're going to standardize this in a way where you, you know, like if you want to start up a raid, you look for like this format for the name and it's going to do these things and it's going to do them cleanly. And if, if you, you know, if, if you fail a raid, it's going to run clean up and then it's going to pause and it's going to run startup. Cause when we didn't have that, like, like stuff would break all the time. Yeah. Um, I, I think, um, Depths of Dark Hollow was when we really like sat down and had that like come to Jesus moment and be like, okay, we can't keep doing this. <laughs> like we keep having these bugs. We keep having these major bugs, you know, late late in beta or even even going live with raids that aren't resetting properly because you know, like you're running reset in multiple places. You're running you're running a reset here when you win, and you're running it here when it resets, and you're running it here because reasons. And if you need to change something, you have to change it in all three places. And if you forget to do that, or if you don't do it properly, then it's going to, it's going to break. Right. Um, so, uh, uh, and I had, again, I, I had just gotten my comp sci degree in my, but my language of choice in college was C and the EQ proprietary scripting language is based on C. So I was able to jump right in and start working on that, which was great. Um, it was something that I kind of innately un understood and was able to to wield and start messing with, and I still made I still made stupid ass mistakes, <laughs> but at least it was it was something that was familiar and uh, it was something I, I kind of understood, yeah. you know, the, the logic and was able to start doing stuff. Um, one of the first things I did on the team was I took the Hollow Shade More War, which was architected using like 167 Invisible Men and all the invisible shouts mm -hmm. and a couple of different like sub zones and it, it never it never really worked properly and i don't i don't know that it could work in um using using invisible shouts but it was something that was it was doable with scripts right uh, so i had to puzzle out okay. like what all these shouts were doing and what all these invisible mans were doing and what all these dialogues were doing and it, that is that stuff is so terrible to to try to troubleshoot and and it's it's almost unmaintainable. There's, there's some, some zones where there's so many NPCs shouting things at each other and you don't know why and what it's supposed to mean. And this guy shouts, this guy hears it. He spawns an invisible man. That invisible man has a timer. When that timer is up, that guy despawns. He says something, this guy hears it. And it's just like, ah, oh. and none of that stuff is in the same place. A lot of it is like scattered around the database. It's not, it's not contiguous. And so you don't realize like this, this shout or this dialogue or this, this NPC, which is integral to the way this works is like over here in the DB. Yeah. You didn't see him because of his his name and his ID was was nothing like the rest of the guys. And then that, anyway, that clearly was not one of my invisible men. Then <laughs> I'll just say for the record, and it could have been right. Like yeah, it could have been where like you you implemented it, and when you did it, it was contiguous. But then somebody else came in after and was like, oh, I, I got to add, you know, I got to add one more dialogue, and I can't add it before or after. So it's going to be plus one thousand, and I'm going to name it differently, and it works. But when it breaks, somebody's going to have like. A, a, a fun time figuring this out yeah there was there was no i i don't think when we were implementing any of that we we even thought about the fact that there would be somebody coming after us right like there was no <laughs> like it was just sort of like make shit in the moment and go and then i hope yeah for the best i guess um <laughs> just real quick hey, kevin yeah i'm oh, sorry go ahead Folks, um, I'm grabbing questions um, and saving them, and so we'll get back to some of the questions. Um, if you um, if you wait for a bit, we'll definitely uh, hit certain points where we can hit them. Um, and then over time, if if I just don't ask, feel free to ask again in chat, and I'll try to keep an eye. All right. Yeah, a lot of that a lot of that original stuff has been rewritten. Like um, uh, this may be getting ahead of stuff, but like for progression servers. Um, these these old expansions are becoming current content again. So people get yeah. to pop and they're like, oh my god, these uh, these events in Plane of Earth don't reset properly, and they probably never did. And um, it wasn't it wasn't a big deal once you know that's old content and you know nobody really cares about that. And there's nothing from it that's like super important to progression or the game. But like once it's current content again, that that mattered. And we're like, oh dude, let's look into this and find out what's going on. Oh no, we got to rewrite it. So right. <laughs> a lot of a lot of stuff in pop got rewritten. Pro probably all of it 
should be rewritten for you know purposes of maintainability and consistency. And, um, but yeah, this this is only so many hours in a day. I just like the team got a whole lot better at using the scripting system over time. We got a lot more functions and functionality out of it. Um, and uh, it was it was a it was a really interesting period for me, um, just because we got scripting and like the only way I knew how to make stuff was like crazy invisible men and shouts and just duct tape and chicken wire and, and you know, trying to like, I understood the logic and then I understood how that logic sort of met our DB. And then when scripting came in, I was like, Oh shit, I don't know how to script. And so it was like, I'd have to go to you and other people and just be like, all right, so I need the following things to happen. Can someone take like five minutes and actually, you know, write this up in a, in a script that I can manipulate? Otherwise I'm going to spend four hours here just sort of staring at a wall. Um, yeah. And after that, it was kind of like, um, that was kind of the last of the real sort of hands-on work I did was, was basically, I think like planes, honestly, from that point forward, I was just kind of doing lead middle management, leading meeting kind of yeah. stuff so did content really just sort of i mean it's interesting how how much was that sort of original style of content creation or carried on after those expansions like legacy of akesha i think was maybe the last thing i i touched touched yes as far as like uh, um for how long after that was legacy content sort of built in that old way or yeah yeah like... um yeah not not yeah from from probably gates on um we had you know we were, we were doing so much with dialogues that involved scripting that you you had to know scripting in order to do like any any sort of design stuff you know if you're talking to a guy that gives you a quest you're talking to a guy that sends you into a dz or you talk to a guy to spawn some sort of event that, that happens right there, like all that stuff is scripted. Um, it, it maybe shouldn't be, it maybe should, should, there should be some like way to, you know, cause things to happen with the dialogue that are mm -hmm. data driven and don't, don't require you to like open up the script editor and, 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 and check for criteria and make things happen. But yeah, like, like kind of, yeah, kind of from that point on anything design related, especially anything where it was like, you talk to a guy and a thing happens at, at, at scripting time. Right. Yeah, and I've, I, I'm just so like old school that um, over the years when I looked at new tools and looked at, um, and we discussed it, uh, for me it was always so easy to just go into a database and kind of know what table something probably originated in logically and do a query yeah. and find a bug. I could find bugs in a heartbeat. And since then I've seen where everything's scripted, it's like weird shit can happen all over the place. And it, and, I don't know. What did you find? Did you see like, was it problematic over time or? It was, yeah. And we, we got better about ferreting out some of those things later. In fact, Chris, Chris Black, who you should have on the show at some point, um, put, in, put in an automated process who, that would uh, look through all the scripts in the DB and see if any of them wouldn't compile. And then we'd get back a report and like these, these script, six scripts aren't compiling, you should look into them. And then sometimes it was like a test script, we don't care. Uh, sometimes it's like somebody just, you know, tinkering around and, and they're not, they're not done with it maybe. And, but sometimes it was like a, a dude opened the script editor, accidentally typed a letter in a script, didn't realize it, and then clicked off that script or saved it. And so then, you know, some, some legacy content just unexpectedly broke. Uh, being able to like identify that, find it, fix it, and, and uh, catch that before it goes live was, uh, was great. Yeah. Um, what was what was the original question? I, I may I, have gone inside. I think you covered it. Um, because I, I was honestly <laughs> like I've I've had like this hobby horse for a long time of um whenever I was looking at new tools or we're discussing design tools, um, I tend to try to find ways to have things just be systematized and data driven more than just yeah. preform scripts for all sorts of shit. Where I'm like, have an encounter table and an NPC table, please. Like, why is why is yeah. this 200 scripts? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Whenever possible, um, design should be using design data to make stuff happen. It should, it should only be when, when the tables can't accomplish whatever you need to accomplish and it's 
and it's important that you rely on the scripting system because it's it's incredibly powerful, but it's also incredibly dangerous. You know, you can do stuff in in complicated ways that even you won't be able to puzzle out when you come back and look at it six months later, and you're like, what? What was I trying to do? You know, I've got this inner inner loop that's looping over this three times and doing ah, oh, what was I thinking? And you know, if you the 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 more complicated you you make something in a script, the more complicated it is to troubleshoot. So um, there was there was something that Ed Harden uh, shared with us at some point. It's like figure like like whatever whatever level of you know skill you're using for implementation for for making the script, it's going to be a level above that to troubleshoot it. And if you're if you're implementing something that's so complex, it's kind of at the edge of your your skill skill level. Yeah, you're not going to be able to effectively. Uh, maintain that and, and figure out why it's not working because it's going to be even harder. <laughs> makes sense. No, it makes a lot of sense. And th that was the fear. That was even the fear before we got scripting. It, there was a lot of yeah. resistance at Sony to giving designers scripting in the first place. Even I could have sworn even Smed chimed in and was like, you know, and it's funny because yeah. the, the thought was like, you already saw what they did with Invisible Men and shit. Like, you want to give these guys scripting as well? There's no telling what could go on. Yeah, and it's it's so hard to kind of uh, formulaically find problems with scripting. Like if, if there's a problem with data, you can probably um, SQL query that and yes. identify it. You know, um, there's there's going to be some complex or not complex series of queries you can run and be like, this guy's got a spell that he can't cast because he doesn't have the mana, mm -hmm. and and this all checks out. So that's a problem. But like if there's something going wrong um, in a script, that can that can be difficult or impossible to identify until you, you know it's a problem. And you, you, you've kind of narrowed it down to like the script is doing something bad <laughs> and right. you're having to go through it. And, and some of those, especially, especially some of the early stuff, uh, those, those things are hundreds or thousands of lines long um, and they shouldn't be, but they are. <laughs> right. So it's <laughs> funny. Know? I think it was like, it was like a point of pride initially with the designers. Like I made this script and it's a thousand lines long. And you're like, but you probably could have gotten that down to 200 if you really thought about the logic. No, um, no, we were paying per line. You know? uh, okay. Well, that, that, yeah. that could have been why. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Uh, Rogan just said, I try to take scripting stuff that was repeated a lot on P99 and bundle it into one function from the actual code, made it a lot more efficient. And then asked yeah. um, Prathen, or is it Prathen? Why well, I keep saying Prathen. Uh, Prathen. Okay. So, <laughs> it's either one. Like, yeah. um, Have you guys ever looked at P99 EQMU scripts to see how they compare to Live EQ? I haven't. And honestly, I probably wouldn't know what I was looking at, but Jonathan, you probably would. I, I haven't no. I, I don't know if that stuff is like easily accessible. If there's a place where we could look at it for for a while, like the P99 stuff was all like um, blacklisted, and you couldn't get to it from uh, from SOE. <laughs> Interesting. I, I don't think it's that way anymore. But um, so, yeah, it, it would it would be interesting to to compare and contrast. Um, yeah, I, I'm betting that P99 has done things with more reusability and more simplicity. It's just it's just a you know if, if you have you know, 15 different designers and you send them all off on their own to do something with, with not a whole lot of oversight, uh, you're going to get 15 different styles of implementation. Mm -hmm. And some are going to be more complicated. And some are going to be more, more buggy and some are going to be more maintainable or less. And you just get a, a really, really kind of varied implementation uh, from that. Yeah. I and yeah, I, I'd be... that, that may have been part of the problem, right? Like we just, uh, you know, like adding adding more people should have probably added more uh, more review, you know, a lot a lot a lot more like close careful peer review. But it would it would just mean we would implement more stuff. Um, we wouldn't we wouldn't use that time to um, uh, like go back and code review and yeah yeah we we weren't using those people to kind of help each other out and kind of. Um, carefully comb over each other's work it was just like we got a new guy he's going to do one one more person's work stuff Good. <laughs> right so i mean part of that at least while i was there um was just pace like i mean we were cranking we were working yeah. on the next expansion almost well at, at one point i thought we started getting better about starting the design of the next expansion while wrapping up the current expansion but so did that stay sort of the, the, the cadence for you guys? Yeah, it was better when it was annual expansions and it wasn't every, every six-ish months. There was, there was less like freaking out and crunching. 
but you would still have that point in the cycle where like everybody was busy, you know, design is slammed. You've got so much to do. You're like, I'm never going to get this done. And, and then uh, just, just when it's like at its worst, art would tap, you know, design on the shoulder and be like, we need design docs for the next expansion. You have to, you need that now. We're, we're blocked. We're like, Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> somebody, somebody or somebody has to stop what they're doing for, you know, two to four weeks to come up with the next expansion and write the you know, zone design docs and, and get that ball rolling. Yeah. And it's, it's those same people who um, are, are doing the next expansions design that are doing the current expansions implementation. And time is always short and they're always, you know, there's always a million things that need to get done. Um, there's always a, a giant pile of design issues from previous expansions that are in, you know, various states of conflagration that need to be looked at. And the, so the, the cadence change eventually um, during that, during that sort of, period where like rich and scott and i and others were kind of pulled off to go to eq2 do you do you remember like that period of time um because that was still during the like every six months i thought absolutely yeah um yeah we, we lost a ton of experienced people you know we lost you and and rich and uh, and hartsman um i think we ended up losing uh jake jake slash oliver yeah <laughs> <You> never know <laughs> Uh, and, and it was hard. We had, we had a lot of like pretty, pretty junior guys who were, were making the game at that point. Um, and I, I think if, if we'd had some more experienced people around, it would have saved us from ourselves and making some of the mistakes that we made in, in gates that, that really bit us. Um, uh, especially like, like the team, the team was just so, so gung ho about making it hard. And I think that was, that was a mistake that, that would, that would have been tempered by some experience having somebody on the team who really, um, could have, could have, you know, pump, pump the brakes on that and be like, okay, guys, I, I know the players are asking for a challenge, but that doesn't mean they want to get kicked in the shins, you know? <laughs> um, it's the interesting one because, um, people, people sort of cite gates in two different periods. It seems like, um, people talk about gates as gates when it first came out, but then reflect back on gates with kind of a different outlook and enjoy how hard it was. Um, yeah, I don't know yeah. if you followed that or, or is that something you're aware yeah. of? Uh, we, I feel like we could write a book on Gates of Discord, uh, just that, that expansion alone. Um, it, was, it was a whole lot of really, really neat ideas um, and a whole lot of questionable implementation. You know, part of it was, was it was a lot of uh, new, new people who you know, were not, not just like um, not just like struggling with being, you know, a, a new designer, but struggling with the implementation. So you're you spending a lot of time just banging your head against the wall, trying to get something to work again, using the scripting system, which is new. You're not super familiar with it. You're doing stuff that's complicated. You want to, you want to make this interesting and special and magical, but also really hard. Uh, you know, people were like throwing everything to the wall to see what would, what would stick. And a lot of it didn't stick and needed to be ripped out. So, um, and, and we had um, a really aggressive, uh, feature set for that expansion right like there was leadership aas uh more a's in general um a new collision system a new pathing system a new graphics engine that's right um we had to redo all the boats in the game i i think i think jason mash just like stared at boats and key points for for three months trying to get that working um uh what and and, and just a, a lot of really complicated content that, that we were doing Right. In, in ways that had never been done before and um and and you know in, in systems that we didn't didn't quite understand and the the beta was not super helpful like the things were still so unstable um due to the new graphics engine that we couldn't really test things effectively mm -hmm. um people would like uh, be in, in a water volume and like hop out of that water volume but it would shoot them flying up into the air a thousand feet and they would come crashing down and die um, there was a, a teleport point on the, the Queen of Thorns in Abysmal Sea where you could teleport in and then this door would swing open and hit you and it would do the same thing. And then the, when the door would collide with the player, it would send them shooting up into the air as high as they could go and they would come crashing down and die from the falling damage. Um, in raid testing, you know, we had um, people would fall through the world. People would get hung up on, uh, on little rocks on the ground and be unable to move. The zone was crashing. <laughs> it's like, like, 
no no iteration, no good iteration, and no testing yeah. really got done during beta because it was it was too um, unstable of, a, of an environment to test on. Uh, so, yeah, there was there was too much going on. Uh, to way, way way that, more than that's horrible the team was really team. like able to. Yeah. I mean, because you're you're basically you're left blind, right? Like it's it's like a because the deadline's not moving. Um, yeah, yeah, it was it was still going to ship when it was going to ship. There was no way that date was going to move. Uh, and yeah, and, and it was. I think we had we had a lot of cool ideas. Some of those ideas probably should have been left on the cutting room floor. Uh, but uh, yeah, not 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 the time or really the experience to execute on them. You know, by by the deadline. So, but we went back later, and a lot of that stuff got re reworked, rewritten. Um, redone, and I think, you know, in, in, its, in its current state, it's, it's pretty interesting. There's, there's some fun raids, some really interesting events, um, some cool ideas with quests, some interesting characters, uh, some some great music. I love the soundtracks in that expansion. And uh, you know, if, if we had had more time, <laughs> I think it would have been a better expansion from the get go. Um, yeah. And again, if we if we'd had some more experienced people, if you or Rich had been there, I think you would have been able to steer that ship a, a little a little more and keep that on track. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I. I believe so. And and I think we kind of proved that to the sort of the management above us um, right after that, right? Yeah. Because that was, it was the same sort of, it seemed like the same scenario going into Omens initially. Yeah. And it was going to be the same thing. And then it was, yeah, it was going to be even worse. Like we were, yeah. we were buried with bugs from Gates at that point. And uh, we had, you know, we, another another aggressive set of features we were going to do for omens, and it was it was not shaping out to be great. So, um, it was it was a miracle that we got some more time. We got you back. We you know took took a step back and really looked at it and like, okay, how how can we actually make this fun and uh, make it work? It, it's such an awkward moment too, like coming back onto the team and then looking at everything that was like everybody's hyped on doing it too. That's that's the hard part, right? Because it's like, we're going to do all this cool shit, and it's like, oh no, oh please no. <laughs> No, you're not. <laughs> Let's just start cutting shit and like redoing it. So, um, this is, yeah. And, and, uh, once those conversations were had though, it's the, you know, like, I, I think that folks recognize that one of the, one of the key ways of kind of having that time is really just being realistic and, and, and going, yeah. all right, you think you can do these three things? That means you might be do, able to do like one and a half. Right. So let's already, yeah. you know, assume that, um, yeah, man, scope is, is such a super important lesson that you need to learn, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, it's just one of those, like my, my ego's writing those checks and my body can't cash moments. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, a couple, couple questions have popped in here while we're still in range of them. Um, so it's funny. Um, Jidlin's. Guidelines. I'll mess up the name sometimes. I'm sorry. Um, ask, could you dive into the reason behind the connection between fall damage and FPS in E2? Oh, that predates me. I, predates I know me. exactly what he's talking about too. You know, the your, your hang time um, is directly tied into how much damage you take from that fall damage, and not not the distance you traveled. <laughs> so, so your your latency will will affect how much damage you take when you when you hit the ground, and I I, I think that's still in. Um, I mean, you you were there before I was. I don't know if you have any exposure to that. Um, the exposure that I had to things sort of melted out of my brain over the last like fifteen eighteen years. Um, I'm sure it's one of those things that just sort of made sense to code at the time. Um, yeah, yeah. I was I was playing Dungeons and Dragons online when that was uh, when that was new. And uh, I jumped on top of a breakable, like a pot, and got got stuck in a falling, you know, state, and and was was stuck there until somebody broke the the pot, and then I fell, and it was the same thing. I I fell, you know, I fell this far. I fell oh. a foot and a half, and I took max damage and was dead. So, um, I don't know if that's still a thing in DDO, but apparently other games have had that same problem. Dude, that's is ultimate realism. It was like slipping in the shower. <laughs> it's super dangerous. <laughs> um, another question came up. From a Siren, what stuff did Prathen make in God? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I did Ink Tuta, which was uh, the raid that you got to off of. Oh God, I'm going to have to equivoc, I think. And I worked on some of the stuff in. Um, 
Ukwa or Ukwa, depending on how you how you pronounce it. Um, and I worked on Rui, which was the the zone that has the the Colosseum in the middle. And so there was the Colosseum battles that would occur periodically, and there was a period. It was a um, uh, what would you call it? A progressive event where you would fight against Colosseum bosses and, and improve this uh, this item. I think it was a ring. There was a pause there, so I was like, "All right." And um, okay. Oh, and I did. I did the Craig Beast Queen. I did I put in a couple of um, quests, small quests, and quest items. Yeah. Cool. And how? So, and how long have you been on the team at that point? Uh, that's a good question. So, I came on the team in late two thousand two, and when did Gates launch? Let's do the math on that. You looking it up? I was about to look it up. All right, you got it. Yeah. Looks like that was early 2004. So, like, I'd been on the team for all of 2003 and a little bit of 2002 and 2004. So, like, a little bit over a year. I probably started working on that content like seven months in, six or seven months into my time on the team. Right. <laughs> it's amazing. It's, it, EverQuest has this history of like so much stuff was made by people over the years within their first like year, year and a half. And it's like, it's pivotal stuff. It's great content. It's, it's sort of the highest of the high end stuff. And it's, it was typically made by junior folks during those first five, six years. Yeah. I, I don't think that really happens anymore. I feel like if somebody joins EverQuest now, we, we expect that they're not going to do anything that complicated until they've been on the team for a couple of years. Um, like modern, modern rain content is so complicated and requires such a, uh, an in-depth understanding of the spell system and the scripting language um, and, and the game's tools in general. That like you, you couldn't expect someone to do that six months in. That would be crazy. Yeah. But yeah, we, we, like, to, we like to throw people in the deep ends on EQ back in the day. <laughs> Welcome to EverQuest. Well, we didn't have a Start choice. Swimming. We didn't have a choice, honestly. It's like we have <laughs> a limited number of people. Um, yeah. So perform, um, please. And <laughs> yeah, and yeah, don't, please don't destroy everything. Uh, another question that came in was, do you remember the first thing that you worked on in EQ? Uh, yeah, the very, very, very first thing I worked on was like the, um, the Grob takeover. So uh, we... We had the frog locks show up and they were going to take over the trolls city grob mm -hmm. and, and set up their own town. Um, and then the trolls got kicked out to Miriak. And so the apprentices, which was me and Norm and um, Carly and, and Tom Blair, I think we're all working on that content. So we were populating um, grob with frog locks and putting some quests in there and some dialogues and some cool stuff. Uh, we put the, the troll NPCs in, in Miriak and gave them a couple quests. I'm like, that, that seems so fun and cool at the time. I was like, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. And looking back on it now, I'm like, oh, I, should, I shouldn't have done that. Like, this quest is so bad. Oh, no way. No way. <laughs> but uh, at, the, at the time, it, it, seems, it seemed amazing. Yeah. It's, but, it's, it's a weird one. Like, um, since I've been back playing on um, PLP and like, then also going back playing on P99, and it's just like, the more I run around and, and see stuff, the more I'm just, uh, it's kind of endearing, right? So it's, it's finding one of those old quests or seeing some of that content. It's just, I don't know. Maybe it's just nostalgia, oh. but there's, <laughs> there's, there's a magic to it. Yeah, there was, um, one, of the, one of the things I did on EverQuest shortly before I left was uh, we, we found there was a quest you could do where you could purchase something from a vendor and you could hand it to a guy and the value you got back on average from completing the quest was more than the cost of purchasing the items. And so you had an infinite money exploit. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got, I got into the SQL and then query, 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 query. And I found all the quests in the game where you could buy all the items you needed to complete the quest from vendors. And you got more money out of it from completing the quest than you put into it. And several of those were from, from that Grob Gukta revamp. Oh. Where, where we were new designers and oops, you know, it seemed like a good idea, you know, let's see, go, go get these, you know, snake eggs and give it to this guy. And he's like, hey, thanks, here's some coin, but you could buy those and it was cheaper to buy them than the reward. <laughs> oops. Yeah. I, 
but again you you folks were brand new and people yeah. weren't necessarily taking a lot of time to uh check work or mentor yeah, beyond yeah. like please don't say anything on fire so um <laughs> kind of in that vein i'm curious um what in uh, i know we haven't gone all the way up through i mean we still have i think at this point like another 15 years worth of everquest to talk about but I, i'm curious the question came in from Seahole. What were the toughest times working on EQ? Um, I'd say the toughest times were between Gates and Omens. Um, if I if I remember properly, we were doing a new tutorial at the time, and that was that was taking a ton of time from a bunch of people on the team, artists and programmers and designers, to get the tutorial working. Um, we were we were getting ready to do another really big expansion, and the um, the problems that were still looming from Gates of Discord were uh were, were like gonna be gonna be a ton of work to dig into and fix and so uh, we, we'd already you know worked a ton of overtime getting gates out the door um we were looking at an impossible deadline for omens and we knew that we had to fix a bunch of stuff so it was just like i i want to say it, it it may not may not have been it, it felt like a year and a half of overtime of just scrambling and panicking and something was always on fire um Actual timeline wise, I don't think it was, but I could, I, I don't think yeah, it, was, it was, but I could see it how was probably, it, it was probably way. more like, like nine months to, yeah. you know, a year of overtime, but it, it just, it, it felt like a year and a half. Yeah. <laughs> um, it yeah. was, it was weird. Like on Dragons of Nora, things calmed down a lot. Um, we, we really were, were a lot more reasonable about what we were trying to do in that expansion and how many raids we were going to make and everything. And it felt weird to like go home on time and be like, well, I'm done this raid and guess i've accomplished my goal for the day and i don't, I don't have to be here till midnight this is weird <laughs> did did you run into i i had this weird experience on um dc because we crunched a lot on dcuo and at one point like i realized we we like sat down um because uh um my wife at the time was working there as well. Fanny and I both worked there. We were both crunching. Yeah. So we actually had like a day off, maybe two days off. And we're sitting there at like in the evening, not knowing what to do. And then like turned on cable and was like, oh, weird. Like their shows. It was like, and it may sound stupid, yeah. but it's like that feeling of like, oh shit, normal people are sitting watching TV at this time not sitting you know eating dinner in the cafeteria getting ready to go back and put in like another five hours yeah yeah there's this weird like i, I want to call it like a postpartum depression after an expansion would launch because the, the couple of months leading up to an expansion launch you're just every every waking moment you're thinking about or working on the game you're squashing bugs you're tuning stuff you're giving people feedback it's just go 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 and then we would we would often get like a, a week of comp time after the you know to cool off and it, and it felt so weird to not, you know, to pause. It felt, it felt like you were sprinting and then suddenly you stopped and it, you know, like, what am I supposed to be doing now? Um, should I be running? Should I be jogging? What's happening? It's, it's funny you mention that because um, we've talked about that like with three or four different guests and I think usually I initiate it, but I'm glad you brought it up because yeah, it's like this launch depression that I would have. Yeah. And I can't, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> I, I, it just feels like, yeah, it's like, because it, there's just, you're so focused and there's just such an creative energy going. And even yeah, if it's yeah. thought, and, it feels <laughs> It's good. like kind of your reality, right? Yeah. Like you get, you get used to that, like amount of energy and excitement and input. And, and then once it's gone, you feel like something's missing. Yeah. And, and oh gosh, that like, like when, when beta was going, going full speed, it's, it's insane how much like feedback you're getting, like constantly emails and PMs and, and chats in, in game and out of game and message board posts and people tapping you on the shoulder. It's like, like you're just constantly buzzing with, with input and you're trying to like do a million things at once. Yeah. And I think part of it's also is in like the realization of, oh man, and maybe this is just me, but there's kind of this weird sense of i'm making even if i don't feel like it's going to 
be world changing. It, it, there's still part of me that kind of feels like I'm I'm making something that uh, has the potential to be great, or I'm making something that I hope uh, people really enjoy, or like I don't know what I'm expecting, but what I realize right after it is shift. Well, okay, that was another expansion, I or that was another product. I got to start another one. Yeah, I've got to ramp up. I've got to be ready to do this again, and it's and none of these things are going to be like the last thing I do. And it's yeah, a weird, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, it, it's like yeah, yeah. It feels like like you you pour your your entire self, all this, you know, your your whole creative well is poured into this product, and then once once it's poured out, you're like, how do I how do I refill this? Like, yeah, I've, yeah, that's so. I don't know. I'm, I've got the feeling this topic's going to keep coming up. We keep digging into it and try to figure out what the hell. Yeah, is that. I know. But just while, while while people are listening, I just want to say it, it's not sustainable and it's not healthy to to live that that lifestyle. And we, yeah. we did it, but I wouldn't recommend it. No. And um, if you so, if so you're many experiencing people... it in the U.S., come to Europe. You <laughs> probably won't have to deal with it. Nice. Yeah, I saw so many um, people uh, have their relationships fall apart. You know, because they weren't they weren't home. You know, the partner's are like, I never see you anymore. I haven't seen you for for six months. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm working on this expansion. It's so important. I'm like, what about our relationship? Yeah, it, it, it happens a ton. Um, yeah. yeah. Notice, I I said ex wife as well, right? Like, in, yeah, yeah. So it's it is a real thing, and then the health problems and everything else are legit. Um, so on the flip side. There is also what was what what were like your your best memories like what were the best times so you, you mentioned improvement but does anything stand out? Uh, I really liked working on Dreadspire. Um, for that expansion, I was kind of like thrown at a zone, and they're like, "This is this is the end zone. This is going to be your zone. You've got." this entire six months to, to just do whatever you want with this zone, go at it. I'm like, woohoo. And so I got to do all kinds of fun stuff. Um, I re really spent a lot of time working on the population. I really spent a lot of time like refining the story and trying to figure out who these characters were going to be and why they would be there and what they would be doing and what their interconnections were. And uh, Mayong was, spoilers, spoiler alert, <laughs> Mayong was the final bad guy. And uh, we, we kept that secret uh, during the development of the expansion. Was, uh, lore wise like even even like the vampires in dread spire didn't know that they were um underneath mayong like misdirection and subterfuge and was was his whole his, his whole thing right like even even the people who worked for him didn't know who he was and they had this really complicated hierarchy and so we got like a, a, a lot of really interesting i think characters and lore and events and and, and the, the zone was really tight thematically um and we put a lot of fun dialogues on guys that helped tell the story and um Al, i worked on that with alan vancouver and he did some super neat stuff in the zone like you would go into the dining room and click on the door and there would be a guy the a greeter who would announce you to the dining room and be like our esteemed guest so-and-so is here and there was this whole underlying thing where like you had been invited to dread spire and you were a guest but you were also food and the people there wanted to eat you <laughs> <laughs> and so all the vampires and werewolves were kind of looking at you like you you were a snack, but they were, you know, in, in certain places you were safe and there was an, an agreement that you wouldn't get eaten, but in other places you weren't. And if you went in there, you were in danger. That's amazing. And uh, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I got I got to do all kinds of fun stuff in the in the raid zone for that zone. I had nine raids and five sub sub raids and um, yeah, and I uh, did did some some really cool mechanics. That maybe like the game wasn't ready for and the scripting system wasn't ready for, <laughs> but I did it anyway. <laughs> um, let's see. The there was a question that came in that I guess uh, along those lines, we'll jump ahead a little bit and but come back. Um, I mean that speaks to a certain level of like mastery within that tool set within that environment. And so Frank asked very early um, uh, in, in the discussion tonight, how does it feel to go from super knowledgeable and entrenched in EQ systems to then be the new kid at Blizzard on WoW? <laughs> oh, yeah. So it, it's weird, right? Like they, they kind of have the same philosophy that EQ does now, where like somebody's not going to really 
comprehend the tools for six months. It's going to take them that long to get to get up to speed. And so I've gone from being able to like implement stuff with my eyes closed and one arm tied behind my back mm -hmm. to being that guy who has to go into this channel and be like, hey, guys, I have a really stupid question again. <laughs> I do the blah blah blah, and they're like, "Oh yeah, you got to go here, open the tool, you know, click on this thing that's a bit mask, you got to set this to two, and then it'll do what you want." But yeah, you just you just have to learn all that stuff, and hopefully, I'm not too old anymore. I can still learn a few new tricks. Well, it's it's interesting you you, you say that because I know you're not, but yeah. like we, I I have felt as like I matured in my career it gets kind of weird like when you go into a new environment and it's like all right i've been working on games so you worked on eq for close to 20 years you go into a new environment mm -hmm. and it's like oh shit i i am kind of a newbie here like can you can you talk about that feeling a little bit more if that's cool like yeah it's uh, it's kind of surreal because um there's i've noticed there are more similarities than there are differences because they're in the same space um they're you know um, high fantasy MMOs that have been out for for decades now. So a lot of the philosophies are the same. A lot of like the the ideas about how you implement content have kind of evolved in the same way and in parallel paths. You know, it might might diverge a little bit, but um, it is it is strangely comforting to to hear people talk about like this is this is how we do quests and this is why and this is how we do population. Mm -hmm. This is why it's like oh that's like the same stuff that we kind of talked about on EQ. Some of that stuff was you know codified or you know. Um, uh, standardized and, and some it just was you know like a thing a thing that you did because you had that um, that experience and that you know in, intuition from working in in this space for a long time um, but yeah the the tools are, are different they I, I probably can't talk about it but um, yeah that's that's going to be the hurdle I think this the, probably the small hurdle is learning um, learning the tools the big hurdle is learning all their games history I mean, I've, I've got thousands of hours in, in WoW, but there's still so much game and so much story and so many characters um, and so much like minutia about like, this is how, you know, this character would talk and this is mm -hmm. how like these characters dress and this is the, you know, that, that, that needs to be kind of uh, learned and, and memorized and internalized so you, you don't, you know, invalidate in, in lore that they've carefully constructed over decades with right. these characters. Oh. Which you know, I I do that stuff on on EQ as well. Like if um, if I'm going to be doing uh, an event or a raid or a quest with a familiar character, someone who's been in EQ for a while, there's a lot of research that goes into that, right? Like you need to go back and kind of look at look at look at everything that's ever been written about this character or by this character, everything they've ever said, and make sure you honor honor that character and and, and they speak the same way and the, the motivations make sense and and you're not stomping on anything lore wise. Yeah. Or, or if you do, it, you need really good reason for it, you know? Right. Which, over over the amount of time that you're there, I could see that becoming more and more of a thing. I remember we'd go digging through random drives of people that had left. Um, we checked, you know, forums. We, we, there was no real central repository for any of that stuff, like on my time yeah. there. And so it's kind of like a, the best info we could find and often there wasn't a lot and then also the best either conspiracy theory in on the forums or the best sort of like concept that they're you know, like anytime they're like i bet it was meant to do this it's like holy shit that's great like <laughs> it, of course we had a plan the whole time yeah, yeah no way <laughs> um so that went Gosh, into we used to oh sorry go ahead i was about to say there's a the question came in from lockers for eq was there a lot of documentation produced about how the game was sewn together and are these still being used so it seemed like yeah it was more later um uh kevin lighty likes to talk about how like when because he's, he's been in the gaming industry for for decades he worked at um midway you know back in the day and he's like the the you know the plan was like you you made this game you created the assets you put it together you shipped it and then that stuff got you know lost or deleted and you went on to the next thing and i think that's that's kind of was the philosophy in early eq either you know they didn't they, they weren't expecting to need to keep you know detailed documentation about everything forever because that, that's not how you made games back then um you know you, you made it and you shipped it and then you moved on to eq2 like like why would why would you you know hold on to every you know scribbled on napkin or you know <laughs> Uh, zone zone design doc or asset like what's the point 
But then like later on in EQ's development, we realized that was, that was super important and you, you needed to go back and look at the history of an, of an asset and you needed to go back and be able to, to tweak a model or you know, look, look at some quest that was in the game in, in 99 and see what, what had happened to it, why it changed, if it broke, how it broke, who broke mm-hmm. it. And, and, and be able to undo that and fix it, you know? And it wasn't till like 2002, I think, um, that change logs went in. So you could, you could search those and see when, when a DB uh, field was changed and who changed it and when. Um, and I think I said when twice, but uh, yeah, like, and uh, it, it was too bad that documentation wasn't, you know, more, more carefully uh, maintained in, in the first place. Yeah. And uh, when when it was, it was it was an incredible resource being able to look, look back at stuff and and uh, understand where someone was coming from. And then there was just also the um, just like working on the game for a long time. You you know you knew like I I know what raids I made and when. And if if it breaks, I I probably know what what it would have been that broke it. You know, if or if someone else implemented, I kind of understand their implementation style and and, and know know what to look for. Yeah. All that, uh, that that tribal knowledge. Kampen, Kampen asks, why is the Mayong model light years ahead of any other model ever to appear in EverQuest? It has more polys than most zones. <laughs> uh, that was Ian Wall, I think. He did some really cool stuff. Um, <gasps> yeah. 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 Uh, he's he, he did some really good stuff, and I, I think he, he, he used some some advanced techniques on that model as well to, to make it work the way it does. Uh, he, he was a, a really talented animator and artist. So um, when was, oh, I forgot. So to, he, he ended up putting Mayong in his, um, his demo reel, right? Like he was, you know, up, updating his, uh, his LinkedIn or something. There probably wasn't even LinkedIn back then. This was what, 2007, 2006. So he like, you know, put Mayong in there and he's like, this is Mayong. I made it for this expansion, blah, blah, blah. But at that point, like players had not reached that point in the plot where they were supposed to uncover that it was Mayong. And they're like, hey, wait a second. <laughs> so I was, I was wondering, yeah, I was wondering exact timing on that because I, I'm trying to think of whether or not, because we, we, we talked pretty frequently back then I can't remember if that was when I was already in Austin on DC or if that's when some of the folks that were working on um, some of the planet side folks that were working on the mercenary game that we were trying to get spun up. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I thought had to help with some models for an expansion or something. So yeah, because I, I remember seeing that model, but I wasn't on the team at the time. I thought it looked pretty badass. Yeah. 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 What was, uh, what was that like working on the, um, the mercenary game? It was, um, like early concept phases you guys had some cool artwork and ideas behind it it was kind of kind of like the agency but not it was so basically it was um it was before mercenaries i I guess the mercenaries kind of come in waves like anything else popularity and I, i think it was before the next big mercenary wave hit so it was kind of a hard sell internally and essentially, we just took the planet side engine and created some new assets, tweaked some of the you know the parameters for like movement and FOV and like um, lethality of weapons and all that. And we were able to. The artists were fantastic. I have like a stack of concept art in my storage unit in Austin still for that, and like uh, some cool. T-shirts. I had T-shirts made for the team that were like the guns for hire, mercenary, flaming town in the background kind of thing. Um, that Patrick actually did the graphics for. And so we, um, we were able to get like a, it was like a 40 on 40 play test up in like two weeks where you were running around in like camo cargos with a hoodie and a backpack and an AK blasting, you know, other people and then flying around in like reavers and stuff. So it was just Mm -hmm. like, it, it was such a fun project, like just to be able to prototype and get it going. But when we looked at, the technical challenges of that engine it was like we're not going to be able to get this up in like the original desired 11 months it was yeah. like 11 12 months you know ship this thing and it, was, it just wasn't going to probably happen. just had like a handful of guys too and the team i think i think the team honestly it could have pulled it off if we got through some of the tech challenges but i also think that was just one of those projects where if the leadership's not all on the same page it's hard to yeah. sort of finalize the sale and move it forward yeah 
it's it's almost better in some situations to have a smaller team because it's easier to get everybody on the same page and yeah. you know m- minimize that time you're spending trying to get everyone you know to be doing the same thing heading in the same direction well there wasn't a lot of need for like leadership overhead or documentation or whatever you could just sort of get together for 10 minutes and go come up with cool shit this is basically what we need next thing you know visa was making a bunch of cool vehicles you know uh raj or uh, arash or you know whomever was like modeling and animating and like things just it just sort of popped because you could walk by and they'd be like hey i just did a, did a dude wearing a hoodie and he's got these pants on and i'd be like oh my god that's badass perfect you know like there's no document needed for that so yeah um so that leads into an interesting question just came in from baiting. Um, do you think there's a future in crowdsource writing or lore for MMOs? EQ has been testing this in recent years. What type of obstacles prevent this from being a thing right now? Um, I'm not a lawyer, but I feel like every time we talk about like uh, players doing work for the game, um, legal steps in and, and there's some sort of a conversation we have to have about labor laws. Mm. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know the details on that. I don't, I don't even want to like, <laughs> no, I, I don't even want to like pretend, pretend to know or, or start to talk about it. But, uh, but apparently that is, that is a concern uh, okay. for the, for those who are legal um, among us. Yeah. And I can see that. Um, let's see. Another question that came in was, um, from self-destruct button, what was the reaction of the EQ design team to EQ2 and the decision to have it run concurrently with EQ? Uh, that's a good question. I'm gonna have to go back, way back in the way back machine to see if I remember if we had many any conversations about it. Um, it seemed like we were we were like impressed with what, what they were doing with their graphics engine at the time. Like they had crabs that looked like photorealistic, you know, like. And, uh, and that was like light years ahead of what we were able to accomplish on EverQuest, obviously. It had a, a pretty cool, you know, graphics engine. Um, I feel like, uh, I mean, I, I feel like everybody has their, their opinion about what EQ should, should look like or feel like. And probably everyone on EQ had, you know, opinions about how it, it did or didn't feel like EverQuest right. anymore. And pro- I bet people on EQ2 were having those same conversations, you know, like, we're going in this direction with this model or this zone or this UI element or whatever. Does it feel like EQ? Yes, no, maybe. Why not? Um, uh, I've, I've been. I, I got to work on their team for a little bit, and uh, and they've got they've got some cool tools. Their population tools are are really nice. Um, they're uh, they're they're. I, yeah, I, I don't even know if I can talk about it. They're, the way the way they store data is completely different than EQ, and it's really foreign if you're moving from one to the other. I um, mean, it really really changes how you how you interact with the game's data, and it's strange. <laughs> yeah, we've we've hit on it a little bit. Um, <clears throat> we've had some people that have been on already talk talk a little bit on that front, and then we yeah. sort of blab on those topics when whenever there aren't guests as well. So. Yeah, so like on, on EQ2, it really helps if you're good at regex and digging through directory structures. Yeah. And if you're on EQ, it really helps if you know SQL and you can query um, complicated um, networks of tables. Mm-hmm. So that, if that gives you any indication. <laughs> yeah, and, and having only glanced a bit at the EQ stuff, because that's, that's where I went when we kind of got pulled off the team um three dates was like go to eq2 and then i i just i looked at the tools and the data like i just it to me it just felt like i was going to basically go all the way back around to being a beginner again yeah on a game you know that i was like i've already worked on this before right and i I like the one that i was working on i don't necessarily want to be a newbie making eq again um what else can i do (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah that was the the kind of the free realms experience um you know there, there was a point where free realms kind of needed to get out the door but they needed time or they needed people and so they make they got people they got like just about everybody at the company was just kind of pulled in to work on that game um, but at the, at the point where it was in its development they didn't want like people to come in and lead the charge they wanted people to just get shit done and so you had all these these experienced designers come in and they're like, we want you to make a simple quest. And you're like, but I'm an expert on, 
you know, redesign and blah, 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 blah. They're like, I don't care. You're going to, you're going to write a little blurb that's 10 words and you're going to make a stupid quest. <laughs> so there were, there were inevitably, you know, these, these power conflicts on that team when, yeah. you know, you, you, you pull in all the experienced people together. You're also pulling in a lot of opinions. <laughs> right. And yeah. And, and, and right or wrong, people who are experienced have, have opinions about how something's going to work. And they're not, they're not just going to sit there and, and implement something if they don't believe like it's a good idea. They're going to they're gonna raise, a, raise a red flag. Yeah, it's, just, it's also more challenging, right? I think once you've put in the time, um, there, there has to be like a really good reason for that individual to sort of step back a bit and go, okay, well, I'm not, I'm not going to fight you on this i i don't believe in it or i hey you know this tool needs to be changed or um you know i don't like this floor or whatever there's got to be a, a damn good reason um so we'll eventually get to this this point but like if i had to guess when you move from 20 years of experience at sony and eq into blizzard and wow and again like you said you're having to learn the tools again you have you you learning the lore and the details there i picture you know the opportunity to go work at blizzard on wow that's a good reason um but given that because uh, i'm trying to remember the order of announcements but like holly left holly left right before you right An announcement wise um, or... yeah 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 um I, I don't remember the exact timeline but yeah she she left not not long before um, I put in my notice. I I um I actually I waited a week and then put in three weeks. So I I had been um I had been offered the job long long before I left. Okay. I think uh, it, it would would have been like six weeks. So I I got the offer about a week later. I put in three weeks notice and then I had a two week break before I started working. Yeah. And on the, oh wow. And can I ask, and some of the stuff, like, I'm just going to ask it. Um, and if you're like, eh, you know, you can, you can next question or tap out or whatever. Um, I don't think I'm going to ask anything too bullshit. Uh, but it's like, did you know about Holly leaving? And was that part of like a consideration or were they coin, did it just sort of coincide or? Uh, I, I didn't know she was leaving and, uh, my, my application was already well, well underway before I found out she was leaving. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And it's one of those things for me, it, because I, I, I know a number of people from Sony that are at, you know, Blizzard or have been at Blizzard for quite a while even. And it's like, to me, it's a natural progression. Um, you know, I, I think for a lot of folks, you just, um, it was mentioned earlier. I don't know. I don't think it wound up as one of the questions on the list. But like, um, there was a comment earlier, and I'm sorry I missed it. Feel free to repeat it. Um, uh, there was a comment earlier. It was just like, I think it was noticeable when you left because everything I've heard since I've been back and sort of, you know, engaging with the community is how much you interacted with the community and like how much you answered people's questions. You're just a very visible person. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, I think the community has really shown a lot of like uh, appreciation for that, at least to me since, since I've been, um, been back 18 yeah, years. I, I think yeah like and like then the you, you go from, and then we <laughs> yeah yeah I mean, and it's such a weird time to leave too because it's, it's the apocalypse and there's this covid and there wasn't any sort of like you know usually like i would take somebody out to lunch you would have a, a big goodbye if they left but this was sort of bittersweet it's like i'm leaving and you know i'm on a zoom call and bye <laughs> mm. you know i don't get to, get to give anybody a hug on the way out the door or you know or share a beer together yeah. um I mean that's a great point. Like I'm in Sweden, so it's so easy to forget how much of oh, an that's right. It's, yeah, it's, had. it's it's yeah, it's not not having a great time. Um, well, uh, I to, oh yeah, so um, yeah, I, it it took me it took me a while to get out of the habit of checking the forums because I I would I would check the forums pretty much all all day off and on whenever I could, including like right before I went to bed, I would pop on and and see if I'd gotten any PM, see if there was anything that was happening. Um, and it was really good to keep, keep abreast of that, to find out if there, if there were any issues, if there's anything we need to look into, um, really, really, you know, catching, catching and fixing bugs as quickly as we could. Um, 
Yeah. And then, and that, and that player feedback, thank you, by the way, is was integral to keeping the game running and making sure it was fun. Yeah. And, and, um, and to clarify my last statement, aware of the impact that it had, but it's the small things like, oh shit, because the same thing happened in, um, with me leaving my company this year as well. And, and because most companies just did voluntary work from home, even if it wasn't mandated, like it was the weirdest offboarding. Like there was no like goodbye lunch. There was no real like, yeah, yeah let's all go out for a beer or whatever. It's just kind of like, I, I had to send an email at some point and be like, Hey guys, um, are you going to turn off my access to everything <laughs> at some point? Just a reminder, I'm, I'm not there anymore. <laughs> Um, so do you think that was kind of, because, you know, people ask, they're like, why wasn't there more fanfare and, you know, this long, glorious message about what's going on and what we should expect <laughs> and how our lot, how, tell us how we'll be able to move on from this, you know, departure, that kind of thing. Was it just yeah. the COVID or? Um, I think, I think the company's relationship um, between like the developers and the players is is different than the players relationship with between the developers and the players, you know, like I, I, I would have, have loved to have some sort of, at least a, you know, a goodbye uh, post or something just, you know, to how, how happy I was to work on the team and how, how, you know, influential EverQuest has been in, in my life before and after I worked on it and how, uh, how much I really liked working with the community. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I guess like our, our new community guy, I say, I say new, I think he's been there for a year or two now. Um, was like he he looked back and almost almost no people that leave, um, un, unless they're like a C level employee get any any kind of fanfare when they leave. It's it's just not a thing that the company does. Uh, and I I don't know what the what the policy is at other companies as well. I I don't know that they do that. I don't know if they want to like you know highlight somebody leaving because it it could be spun. It prob probably will be spun as as bad for their company and bad for the game if somebody's taken off. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. It, it's because it's not, that's not just, I mean, I've seen that in a lot of places. And it's just kind of a weird old school mentality. Uh, that, that's my opinion. You don't have to agree with that, Jonathan, or not, or anything. But know. like when, yeah. I, when I think about it, it's like communication and, and like it's weird because the same companies that will not like sort of, you know, just be direct with that sort of information and be like, Hey, this is what's going on. This is what it's mean, what it means and blah, blah, blah. And like, let's celebrate close to 20 years of like you being a part of the community and kicking ass and, and, you know, making great shit and blah, blah, blah. Like, I'm not saying this specifically to, uh, to, I always want to say Sony. Um, you're right. <laughs> Dark Ball or anything like that. Um, Daybreak. Um, but I say companies in general, for as much time as companies like been trying to figure out how to be authentic and hire like, you know, marketing tricksters or whatever to make them seem authentic, just just be authentic. Do shit like celebrate the people that work, you know, on your product when they leave and be open about it and be like, you know, even if it's like, you know, well, we saw a giant suitcase full of money in Jonathan's mm -hmm. hand. And so it was just like, of course, good for him. High five him <laughs> on the way out. A little, you know, pat on the butt. Money, money trailing behind. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I think when people talk about like whether or not a company cares, they're, they're talking about, yeah, open communication, open, open and honest communication. Uh, and yeah. And, and honestly, that, that was kind of the, the fun part of the game, especially during beta, which is talking to the players and, um, work, working with them and communicating about what was what was going well and what wasn't and how we could fix it and, and carrying that that over like once once the expansion launched too like it wasn't done like we still had to go back and make changes mm -hmm. that, and the iteration iteration is everything that iteration was really important to keeping the the content functional and fun yeah so there was a question came in I don't, I don't know if you'll be able to answer so Yinla Yinla asked. Is there anything you were working on for the next expansion that someone else is taking over that we can watch out for? Um, I think the last thing I really worked on before I left was I did the uh, the next Heritage Crate, um, and I'm not you know I haven't I haven't really been following of that. It may already be live uh, at this point. I don't know. I think it was the the Dwarf Heritage Crate. Um, 
and um, what I was working on at the very end was just documenting my my processes and um, and anything that 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 only I did and only yeah. only I really had like the the knowledge from start from front to back on how to get something done. Try to document all that stuff. Uh, give people my spreadsheets, my SQL queries, and whatever, and hand it to them and be like, "This is how I did it." Um, so. Uh, there were some raids that I wanted to work on, and they were on my list of things to do, but they, I didn't. Uh, I didn't even start on them. And on, you know, quite honestly, when when we've had designers like get partway through a raid and leave, it's always bad. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it's really better if one person is is in charge of that from from beginning to end. It's it's not good uh, to have have somebody pick it up halfway through. Um, it it's never good. So. So I think that's okay. It was, you know, it was, it was kind of kind of a clean break as far as like working on content stuff was done. I wasn't I wasn't like halfway through anything. The mention of SQL or SQL there again um, leads me to a question that's been sitting here. Broken asks, um, "I'm surprised EQ data resides in SQL." I know they moved uh, moved to it over the years, but wasn't it the original implementation all flat file? <clears throat> I thought the it exported to a flat file, but like the work we did was in a DB. Yeah, um, yeah. The game data is all in a database, um, in, including the scripting uh, stuff. It's all it's in, the, in the in the scripts table and the name and. ID and the, the scripts data itself and the, all the modified stuff. Um, the data in the game is a flat file. So, so once you've got all your, your population data and you export that, and that creates text files that live on the server and then tell, you know, tell the zone how to behave, what to spawn, when and where, and what it, what it does when it pops up and stuff. Um, and then character files um, used to be flat files, but now they're, now they're also in a DB as of semi-recently. <laughs> Yeah. But it's been great. Like um, the intake can probably comment on this, but it's allowed us to like, you know, run run SQL against you know the players to remove remove bad data. If, if somebody has a, a broken quest or um, is is in some sort of a bad state, we can we can fix that fairly easily. Whereas before that was a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Going back to an earlier question. Keebs had asked, what was your most passion-driven project during your whole eight years? Uh, I'm going to try to be passionate about everything. Um, I was particularly stoked to work on the Rogue Epic because I, I played a Rogue on live, um, and, and getting my Rogue uh, Epic 1.0 was, was a huge deal. And I was on, on Cloud9 for like weeks after I got that. I made, I made like a... A flash video, I think, of, of me getting it and <laughs> you know shared it with my guild back when we did that sort of stuff. Um, so I got to when we ended up doing omens and working on Epic 1.5s and 2.0s, um, I was I was able to do the rogue epic and I really tried to tie that in um, as best I could with, with the game's lore and with the original quest and, and keep that going. Um, and, and it was it was really an honor to be able to work on that. So on that note. Do you or did you secretly play EQ on a regular account? Um, Bobby Bick says, I think it was Jay Chan that said she raids anonymous. Oh, that's cool. Um, I mostly would play on progression servers in a sort of casual way, especially when a progression server would first come out. I would spend a lot of time running around on the server uh, doing stuff. It 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 gets hard to like like separate the developer side from the player side though. Like when you're playing it. You know, you see somebody cheating. It's like, all right, alt tab, send an email to CS. This guy's being a douchebag, blah blah blah. Or you know, you're running around doing something, and something drops. It shouldn't be there. Like, all right, alt tab out. Make a note on Monday. Look into problem with this thing, blah blah blah. So it's it's different, right? Like when when you're when you're playing your own game, you you have you, it's it's hard to not look at it with a critical eye and constantly be um, playing playing it as a developer. Did you? But did you get a chance to do any of your own raids? Um, I don't think so. I think by the time like I was working on raids, there wasn't enough like time in my my after after work yeah. life, or <laughs> you know, like and every, yeah, no, everybody yeah. does that too. Like when I first joined the team, I was I was playing a ton and working on the game. But at at, at some point, you realize after after you know being there for 40, 60, 80 hours, like you can't. 
can't look at it when you go home. <laughs> and, and, and you think you will and, until, you know, you're a couple years in, you're like, dude, when I go home, I don't want to look at a screen. I just want to go for a walk. I just want to go splash around the pool. Yeah. I want to make dinner. I want to see my wife, you know, like you need, you need, you need time away from EQ when you're not working on it. Yeah, I agree. Um, the, um, thank, uh, thank you. CQ asked, do you remember any of the design process with behind making the, uh, Muratus raid? Did you follow guild progression on it at all? Expected it to be as difficult as it was. I'm pretty sure I butchered the name. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. yeah no, I get it. Um, I think we called it Miratus. Miratus? Stone domain. It's the, the unpronounceable zone. Um, yeah, I, I was, um, I wanted it to be hard. I, I always want my raids to be challenging, but since it was the end raid expansion, I wanted it to be really hard. Um, and I, I try to err on the side of too hard. And with that, with that particular raid, I erred on the side of like way too hard. <laughs> so I think, I think fairly early on um, after launch, um, once, once people were really digging into it, I, um, I was ready to put it, push in a wave of changes that were going to make it substantially easier. But um, we got feedback from the players that, that some guilds were close and they didn't want it changed and they wanted the, the, the cachet of beating it before um, this, these changes went in. So I, so I backed those changes out um, and people were close and they were, were able to beat it um, in, its, in its super hard state. But after that, like, um, I, would, I would periodically put in you know, a wave of, of changes that would make some mechanics more forgiving um, and easier. Like there was a point where you had to, like everybody got a different colored buff and you had to scatter mm -hmm. into the, the wing of the zone that matched the color of your buff or else you would die. But while you were doing that, you were having to dodge a bunch of hazards in the room and you, know, you didn't have a whole lot of time to get there. So you couldn't like super carefully, like, you know, wind your way around these hazards. And so people would die uh, trying, to, trying to get to safety. So I, I think I put in a, a protection so you, you could get hit by this a couple of times before they would actually hurt you. And, and I, I think that was a good change. Um, the, the, the mechanics still work and they're still difficult, but it, it didn't, wasn't super punishing. Right. That makes sense. And I didn't realize this. So were you the spell developer? Yeah, 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 and for for a while. For a while. Uh, ooh, that's a good question. I'm gonna have to. Okay. Do the expansion searches. Yeah. And while you're looking that up, um, this was Yinla's question. What, what were your highs and lows of being the spell developer? Uh, let's see. So I I want to say it was like serpent spine to seeds, but I'm, I may be way off on that. So somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the, you know, uh, I'll, do the, I'll do the lows first. So like we didn't, we didn't have a whole lot of people on the team and I was, while working on spells, I was still kind of the senior raid designer. And so I was doing a bunch of uh, the expansion raid content um, as well as doing all the player spells and abilities, which is, which is by itself a full-time job. Um, and there's this, there is a assumption or an expectation that if you're working on a game system like spells, you're also in charge of balancing the game. And that, that is also a full-time job. <laughs> so yeah, it was separate. You know, I, fe job, I yeah. felt like doing, it felt like doing the job of, of, of two and a half people. It was, it was really more than, than one person could, could realistically get done and, and done well. So I, I just, I, I feel like, you know, some of that stuff should have been farmed out better, or I should have been better about being like, this is crazy. You know, I'm about to have my my second you know nervous breakdown of the year. <laughs> um, uh, as far as the good stuff, it was it was really cool and creative. Like there was a lot of uh, um, freedom to do to do stuff that I thought would be flavorful and fun for different classes. Um, I probably, you know, I feel like when when you're coming up with an idea for a new spell, like less than fifty percent of the time, is it a spell that you actually should make? <laughs> you know it's again like you just you're just trying things you know um you, you know we're tinkering with new spas uh go you know going with new ideas and seeing how well they work a lot of that stuff probably should have just not happened at all and been cut because it was it was gonna gonna be questionable but um but i, I i'm happy with some of the stuff that, that that i did that ended up becoming you know um class defining abilities from from then on it's funny as you're saying that I realized we had another question up and I also realized that um, I might have fixed the thing that makes the questions pop up on the screen. 
So I just clicked it and it worked amazing. Oh, nice. Um, the question is, how successful do you think uh, studio efforts at Class Balance have been over your tenure? Uh, do you think the modern symmetrical tree is easier to manage than early days? Um, I think it's gotten harder and harder the more abilities that players have uh, and the more like spell effects and item effects and clicks and procs and, and passive effects and AA effects they've got, the harder it is to tune. There's, there's just more stuff there than one person can realistically keep an eye on. And, and, and the game is a bullet train going 200 miles an hour and you, and you can't stop really to, um, to evaluate the class balance and, and, um, and, and it's a moving target. Every, every time we introduced, you know, a new, a new ability, the class balance changed. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an, an incredibly difficult task. You know, one or two people probably should have been devoted to doing just that. And it, it wasn't a thing that we could devote time to. Right. Yeah, it's. Uh, do you think that's it, is it inevitable? The the sort of complexity, um, is it just inevitable when you when you have a game that sits around for twenty years, or do you think if you could go back to sort of the first couple of years of EverQuest um, and say, all right, we know I had a vision of the future. Um, it, this game's going to be around for at least twenty years. I know this. I pictured myself. 18 years from now like um still working on it about to leave but um do you think it could be developed in a way where it would retain players for 20 years and not grow as complex yeah it, it seems like it's happened with all the major mmos there is this complexity creep and i think I think some games have been better about battling that than others. I think some, some games recognize, okay, this system is, you know, a time sink. Um, it's not really that interesting. It's not super maintainable. Maybe we should just retire it. <laughs> you know, right. this, this isn't, this isn't really like adding anything fun or fun or fresh to the game. It's just something that's a constant like bookkeeping nightmare. Um, and it's confusing for us and it's confusing for the players and it's diluting like uh, how, how we give power to the players. Let's just get rid of it. Um, uh, I think EverQuest probably sh should should have um, devoted more time to battling that complexity creep and, and and not either either not put in so many buttons or or found ways to combine more more ways to combine buttons so there weren't weren't so many things to click on. It's just it's too easy and too splashy and too too fun. I think um, when you're when you're working on you know um, a game system to to give out another button and and. Not, not it's not only EQ and EQ2 that, that, that do this, but you know, other other MMOs as well. Is yeah. at some point over over years, over decades, you end up getting with an un, an unmanageable um, number of things to press. Yeah, but the alternative is the, the stagnation. Yeah, I mean, is there is there is yeah, there... maybe yeah, maybe it's better to like like rotate in a cool new system. And let people enjoy that for I don't know a year a year or five, and then rotate it out, and then put something in a different thing in to take its place from that year on. Yeah, because yeah, uh, it it ends up being like the UI bloat alone just ends up being bananas, right? Like, yeah. And like, how many how many windows do I need to look in in order to like play my character effectively? And yeah. See what I can do. The the. The fact that you you have been on the team up until so recently, I think there are a number of questions that have been coming up, and I see a few of them in the list that are related to like TLPs and um, I guess let, let me just uh, I'll, I'll go through a couple of them and, and you'll kind of see the theme. So Keebs asked on the topic of TLPs, did you feel the VP group named items should have been removed? Um, for Rage Fire and Lost Dawn. Um, is that saying that there's items in VP that are named after developers that should have been changed? Uh, I, 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 don't, I guess I don't understand quite what the question is asking. I think it's for, for the keys. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, was he, is he talking about the keys? I'm, um, I'm guessing keys. Keeps. I'll keep an eye on chat to see if that's because okay. there's another yeah. question. Yeah, if he's talking about the keys, so I, I guess, I mean, I wasn't oh, there for. Oh. I was, I was playing EQ, you know, in, in, incredibly heavily when when those keys were a thing, and I spent all night, you know, um, at the rotting skeleton in Dreadlands trying to get that key piece. I, I must. I, I don't remember exactly how long it was, but it must have been over 20 hours in that one spot trying to get that one that one piece of nine <laughs> for my VP key. Uh, to the point where, like, I had I had a timer set up um, so that I would like, you know, nod my, nod my head down and go to sleep, and it would go off, and I would like wake up and be like, "Oh, it's time to kill the rotting skeleton again." Uh, I didn't have it. Set the alarm. Go back to sleep. Yeah. Um, and I I guess that that stuff made sense back in the day. You wanted these zones to be exclusive. You wanted you know there to be like a, a pretty heavy time investment into to getting the keys that you needed to get there. And it was something that like not everybody was doing, right? Like most people were like. Most people are still leveling, still gearing up. Not not everybody is butting their head against this key quest at the at the same time, right? In a way that that creates this player collision and friction. Um, but on progression servers, it was a thing. Uh, we changed the quest a whole bunch of times uh, to try to make it easier. We made the stuff spawn more frequently. Uh, we tried to scatter out the ground spawns in a way where like it wasn't a bunch of people sitting in one spot, all you know, spam clicking on that spot to try to get the item. Um, we made the, the drops on the NPCs drop drop more frequently and and or have them spawn more frequently. I think Alan did that. But it's it's still rough. And and we have to, you know, the EverQuest team constantly has to ask that question on progression servers like, it, you know, is is it classic? Is it reminiscent of the way the, the game originally performed? Is it nostalgic? Um, is it fair? Is it fun? You know, what's and what's the most important part of that? And and you know, where should where should you go in that triangle? How classic right. should it be? How fair should it be? How fun should it be? Yeah, and and it seems like a one that needs active balancing, given the fact that you know, it's it's not strict on any one of those those like points, especially like the classic one. Like, yeah. I've been playing, and you know, with the with the rate of experience gain and other things that sort of push people into the high end. It, it, it's um, yeah, it looks like there are certain things that that have to be tuned as part of that. Keeps clarifying and said, no, there were items that dropped in BP that were removed from named. So that, that, that was the actual question. Okay. Um, um, I don't know. That's that uh, question should probably be sent to the current step team. Yeah. Um, they, they can probably look into it and uh, it, it sounds like it's what, this is one of those things where like there was, additional content that was added after the fact. And so, you know, on, on live originally the, the zone was in one state, but then it was changed. And then for progression servers, there's some sort of logic in there that determines, you know, what, what drops and when and how, and um, yeah. Mm. And it, it, it's going to be one of those, like, is it, is it classic? Is it fair? Is it fun? You know, conversations and uh, yeah. And then, um, Tennessee Feet Monk asked two questions about Luckland's Vexal. Compared to other early expansions, Vexal mobs have such obscenely high hit points. AC, why? That's um, and then also Vexal. Yeah, uh, I think. Um, and then there's also a Vexal revamp in 2002, removed about 18 raid drops, but didn't replace them with fixed better items. Why? I would I would refer you back to previous vods. Check out I think. Um, Bill Fisher's and Rich Waters. It'll it'll get you started on that topic, I believe. Um, and then we'll we'll get you some other answers at some other point. But that was that was a bit before before your time and back when I wasn't. Yeah, I was just an apprentice trying to figure shit out myself. So yeah, uh, yeah. There was there was all kinds of crazy stuff happening in pop era that I was like aware of because it was happening around me. But I wasn't actually involved <laughs> in those conversations. <laughs> yeah, that was you know, me I was at, Yeah, <laughs> you know, I had my heads down doing apprentice or associate design work, and other people were like, "Oh my god!" You know, plenty, of, plenty of time. Since we're 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 we're, we're just talking TLP, um, Happy Feet asks, "Do you feel like all the botting and automation runs EQ for the rest of us that want to just play the game?" I'm still baffled that they do nothing when people are MQing 40 boxes. Do you have thoughts on bots? Uh, yeah. Um, I feel semi-comfortable speaking for all of design and that n- nobody in design likes the fact that there's automated play. 
um, and feels like people shouldn't do that. But um, it's it's not design's um, purview to fix that. Mm. That's going to be on on community and potentially on code. That's that's you know d design can't solve that problem. Is can you speak to whether or not there there's an actual desire to fix it or is it is it just sort of like hey it's not a priority and there are critical resources there or is it more of a these people they play a role in the community or in the customer base um um it's I'm going to speak generally and not about yeah. any particular game. Um, as I've, I've read, you know, articles and stuff about this elsewhere. It's it's an arms race uh, to prevent players from cheating in your game, and it's an arms race that you will almost always lose as a developer because the players have more resources and more time and more people. And it's something that almost all developers want to fix, but we're fighting a losing battle. And, yeah. and, and again, I'm not I'm not speaking about any particular game. I'm just saying in, in general, um, as as a game developer in the games industry, that's that's how that works. And, and, and unless you can you can devote a whole lot of time and money to it, it's it's a difficult problem to solve. Yeah, I've I've run into it on the past product, and the thing that we were realizing was also the money that was being generated on the oppose for the opposing side in the arms race, I think they actually could have allocated more resources to their fight than we could to ours on this particular yeah. product. And that was just, that was it. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's see. So, um, did you make promise renewal? Do you remember anything about trying to fix clerics need to complete heal all the time? As uh, well, yeah, dude. I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that that's a that's a really good example of like a spell that I conjured up, and I was using new new tools that we had at the time, and thought it would be fun. Um, it's a way to give players a, a big heal, um, not a complete heal. And complete heal has been a misnomer since <laughs> people got more hit points than complete heal could heal. Yeah. But it was it was for a way a way for players to pre heal an ally. Um, and and then after after a delay, the spell would fire and heal them up. And I and I, I thought it was a really cool idea for clerics. Um, I feel like it was one one of the few be better ideas I had while I was developing spells. Um, it actually ended up being a lot more difficult to implement than I thought it would because of focus effects. Like, you know, the spell runs for I think it was like one or two ticks, and then it fires. But if you have extended you know duration, then that extends the time it takes before this thing um, will go off, which is not what you want. So then you have to start putting like focus effect restrictions and in in various places to prevent mm. that from happening and there was there was a lot of like spell trickery that we had to had to put in uh, to make sure that that work was intended and having focus effects didn't didn't make it worse right um it's funny because as you're saying that i was just thinking back to the complexity question right like it's 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 interesting when, once you've have when when you have like 10, 15 years of complexity built up and then you add a thing there's this there's always that chance of like some weird rube goldberg kind of like the yeah. spell kicks the you know ball that tips over a candle and um yeah and we, we always had to worry about um hot spots for experience at, at some point like it, it it almost always was easier to go back and farm a bunch of really really low low risk super easy to kill stuff uh, than it was to tackle modern content. Just um, the, the lack of risk was, was better than, um, even if it was better experience killing higher level stuff, you know, not, not having any, any chance of dying made it better. Yeah. To, to slum it in old zones. So we got caught up asking, asking some of these questions. I, I kind of want to get back, you know, if, if we've got time, I, I, I want to hop back into your, your actual progression on EQ for, for a few minutes and just kind of, so you were, you were the spell guy. Mm -hmm. Like what other roles did you fill over that 18 years? Um, I think the, the most impactful things that I did over, over the years were like being, being the spells guy for a couple of years, which was like a relatively small period of time, given, given the amount of time I was there, it was probably two or three years of, of the 18. 
um, being the the raid guy and uh, and creating a lot of the the raid content for expansion. Some, sometimes I did every raid in the expansion, and sometimes I just did you know a couple zones, depending on uh, the schedule and and the team and our needs at the time. Um, and I think working on progression servers, um, and there's 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 a lot of different facets of like working on on progression servers. We've got guys who like set up the progression itself to ensure that like after certain periods of time or when certain criteria have occurred or what you know when when it um, when an event runs, then everything switches over properly and the next expansion activates. But there's there's a lot of work that goes into making sure that the stuff in the expansion is is there when it needs to be there and mm -hmm. and you know. Um, stuff doesn't turn on too early or too late based off of our fuzzy criteria of what's what's an error and what's appropriate. And and I I did a lot of work on that and that was uh, that was a lot of fun. It, it it is it is really fun to go back and kind of like tinker with old content, see how it works, reminisce about you know what what it was like to experience that content back in the day. And um, yeah, Frank reminded me that we left off at Omens um, you know earlier, but it's it interesting for me to try to piece together like the evolution of the team during during those years like having ryan on different people on and and yeah you know naturally a team gets smaller over time um which probably means going back to wearing more hats um still did you feel like did you feel like there was still that same expectation of scale of content that you release or like pace or did did anything change over over time i mean naturally the community gets smaller right like yeah. um did that change the dynamic behind the scenes um yeah i'm sorry uh just, just as a heads up my wife has given me the um the, i need to help pack stuff to, <laughs> yeah to i was wondering if that was the case i saw you look up <laughs> a couple times <laughs> yeah i didn't realize it. it it had been two hours already it goes so fast Okay. Yeah. So uh, we'll have to, uh, but I, I'm, I'm happy to come back if you want to do, that would be amazing. do another, sure. yeah. yeah. Uh, do the next nine years. Um, the, I think the raid content has gotten more complex over time. If, if that, if that answers the question where um, you could, we could kind of get away with relatively simple mechanics uh, back in the day, but as, as, as players have gotten more tools in their toolbox and they, and they become more accustomed to doing more complex stuff, you kind of have to, to raise the bar on newer mm -hmm. raids to give give them more mechanics or more uh, more mechanics happening at the same time that they have to deal with to make it to make it fun and interesting. Uh, yeah. So that that's that's been one thing that's kind of changed over time. And I tell you what, um, what we'll do because it's funny you made the offer. We can cover the next nine years um, next time you come on. Um, I I know you need to go. I can I can. And so, and yeah so um and i appreciate you taking two hours with us tonight um i'm gonna i'll follow yeah. up with you um we'll sort of talk about your experience here today kind of see how you how you like it if you already know like hey i'd love to come back and cool we can already get everybody hyped because i know they're going to want to see you um then we can we can time it just based off your move and things like that once you get settled in maybe yeah that'd be great Cool. Yeah, it was it was really good seeing you. Um, I I enjoyed the times we worked together back in the day. <laughs> yeah, like the smile, like the 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 positivity was. It's one of those things that <laughs> I've never forgotten. So it's kind of cool to like oh, get to actually see you, you know, and talk sort of face to face. <laughs> air quotes. Um, yeah, it's same dude. Um, and and yeah, I'd love to catch up some more. I'll I'll try to think of try to think of some some additional questions that can maybe help me hone in a, a bit more on like i because I, I really want to try to piece together and get a feel for like the evolution of the team culture the evolution of sort of the dynamic that feeling about like working on an mmo when it's in that second decade of its sort of lifespan there's a lot yeah. there that I, we've never seen it before really there's only a few mmos that have done this so i'd love to learn about that so yeah next time yeah, that would be awesome yeah Cool, dude. Um, I really, really appreciate it again. Um, thanks. I'm sure, yeah, Kat is appreciative as well. And Thanks, um, guys. Cool. We'll, we'll talk about when we can get you back. Okay. Awesome. Have a good night and uh, good luck on the move. Yeah. Thanks a lot.
Likewise. See you, Jonathan. <laughs> All right, see you.